Tiny Studies. Uh, welcome you all, especially our guest speakers, to this uh, evening event uh, themed on uh, Hong Kong's autonomy after the national security law challenges and perspectives. Uh, before I uh, open the discussion, um, I am happy to uh, acknowledge and also thank uh, Ambassador Ashok Kantha, the director ICS, for giving me this opportunity to conduct this event. Uh, and more importantly, I must also thank uh, all the legwork done by uh, our young colleagues in ICS, uh, Anand and Samanwe. I think without whom this evening's event perhaps would not be possible so smoothly. Um, with those words, uh, I now welcome uh, our guest speakers. Uh, I will not read out the introduction which has been distributed along with the uh, webinar flyer, just to save time. But I must say that um, maybe ironical, uh, I prefer to call our four distinguished uh, speakers as the Hong Kong's Gang of Four. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> without any offense, of course. And uh, uh, as you know, as we open up this discussion, I think there is a sigh of relief in Beijing, especially uh, among the Beijing authorities. Uh, for two reasons. One, uh, especially those who are in Hong Kong, they know it better than us, that there has been uh, a Hong Kong citizens uh, poll survey, uh, especially among all the all the poll survey participants were pro-democracy pro supporters. And they were going to vote uh, whether the 22 uh, pan-democratic alliance uh, let go elected members should resign from the unlawful uh, LECCO for next one year, or should they continue to serve uh, the LECCO? So the outcome of that survey is that it's there is a vertical split among the voters. Um, the reports say that 47.1% uh, voters wanted them to stay on, whereas 45.8% uh, of the voters wanted them to withdraw. So in that event, uh, the um, chairman of the Democratic Party in Hong Kong, uh, Mr. Wa Waichi, has announced that all the 22 opposition LECCO elected members have decided to continue to serve for the next one year. Uh, this, I think, brings uh, a sigh of relief in Beijing for two reasons, as I said. One, because it gives some kind of a legitimacy to the unlawful extension of LECCO for one year, on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, Beijing is very happy that the 22 uh, opposition um, uh, lawmakers have decided to continue to serve for next one year because Beijing sees this as uh, some kind of a setback to the foreign forces who were expecting that these opposition uh, lawmakers would resign and the foreign forces will get an excuse or the opportunity to impose further sanctions uh, against the HKSAR, that is Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Government. So Beijing has uh, good, good enough reasons to celebrate mid-autumn festival uh, and also go into National Day holiday with a sigh of relief uh, of what is happening in Hong Kong or what happened in Hong Kong, especially in the past 48 hours. And also uh, come added to that is the uh, dwindling of the size of the street protest in Beijing, as well as uh, the uncertainty among the ranks of the democratic supporters, because there is a complete confusion what to do now, next one year. But uh, to tell us more about this, uh, we have an excellent uh, panel of four very distinguished uh, speakers. Um, three out of four uh, serve in universities. Uh, Sebastian, as you must have read, uh, uh, is uh, at the Advanced School of Social Sciences, uh, EHESS in Paris. He also is concurrently holding the uh, honorary professorship at the University of Hong Kong. 
Sebastian actually is very uh, not unfamiliar to many of us in ICS because he had been to ICS uh, eight years ago in 2012. And he had read, people remember him uh, for having presented a very uh, stimulative and thought-provoking paper on Lushun when ICS had organized the 130th birth anniversary international seminar on Lushun. And uh, we all remember you, Sebastian. And uh, then we have Victoria, who is a PhD from Columbia University. But presently, she's uh, teaching political science at uh, Notre Dame uh, in Indiana, USA. Then we have Samson Yuan, who is at the Baptist University of Hong Kong. And then last but not the least, Ilaria. Uh, Ilaria wears uh, several hats. Uh, other than being a celebrity journalist, she's uh, a poet and an author and writer. And um, if I can take the liberty, I can say that all four of them uh, have been in the thick of uh, what has been happening in Hong Kong for a long time now. And I think nobody knows better what is happening in Hong Kong, especially in the last two, three years, uh, better than uh, our four distinguished uh, speakers. That is why I took the liberty of calling them Gang of Four, quote in quote. And uh, with, without further ado, uh, I begin the evening by inviting uh, Sebastian. Uh, first, and as I had written to you in my email, that we would request the speakers to make their opening remarks, uh, uh, limiting themselves to five to seven minutes each. And follow at the end of each speaker, uh, I will use my prerogative and ask a question to each speaker. That should take uh, 10 minutes or so. And then in the third round, uh, we'll have uh, the opportunity for the speakers to either comment or uh, ask a question to their fellow speakers. That should also be uh, over in 10 minutes or so. And then we go into our final round of uh, participants uh, asking question, Q and A. The participants have two options to ask questions. They can raise hands and uh, speak up uh, their questions, or they can write and send in uh, their questions in the chat box. So with this, uh, I, uh, Sebastian, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Thanks so much for the invitation. And also, uh, it's, it's really a great pleasure to be back with you. I was also thinking about that wonderful conference you organized uh, eight years ago, and it was just, um, just before uh, the uh, uh, Congress at which uh, the party Congress at which Xi Jinping became Secretary General. So we were speculating a lot about what was going to happen. So uh, quite a few things uh, have indeed happened uh, since then. But I won't dwell on that because time is limited. Limited. So let me uh, just say a few things about the uh, national security law to get things going. So as I um, as I argued previously, I think um, the national security law, in the words of uh, uh, one of the uh, influential advisors uh, in Beijing, uh, Jiang Shikong, uh, should be seen as a restructuring of Hong Kong. It's not simply a loophole or something that is uh, um, sort of incidental. It's, it should be understood as a restructuring. Um, I won't dwell too long on the content. Of course, uh, uh, it, 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 we know that it creates four new crimes that may be in conflict with Hong Kong law, separatism, subversion, terrorism, and collusion. Um, it um, opens the border between Hong Kong and China. Certain suspects can be tried in China without uh, going through an extradition procedure. Um, it also creates a new institution, so uh, a, a new prosecution system in Hong Kong, a, a Hong Kong Committee for National Security on which the head of the liaison office is a member, and a central government commissioner for national security in Hong Kong. Um, so uh, it uh, considerably uh, reorganizes, in fact, the functioning of of the uh, Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. It also uh, seems to in institutionalize, although this has not uh, been confirmed, which is usual, uh, the role of the uh, leading small group under the Central Committee uh, for Hong Kong, uh, and the role of the national security organs on that leading small group, which uh, since um, last year seem to have been taking a, a stronger, a, a greater role in uh, Hong Kong and Macau affairs. So uh, why did it happen? Of course, we know that the proximate cause are the demonstrations of 2019. So 
by the end of July 2019, there was a uh, Politburo meeting, uh, which was reflected in People's Daily, and certain formulations from that meeting uh, were then uh, uh, re, uh, republished in People's Daily and in other documents, and they sort of uh, began to snowball into, I think, what would become the national security law. Um, so as early as September, in fact, uh, Zhao Keju, the uh, um, Minister of Public Security, uh, began to appear in Hong Kong and Macau uh, 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 system meetings. Um, so September, then again in November, in December, and then of course at one point it became clear that he was the um, uh, co-chair or the uh, um, perhaps deputy chair of this um, committee. So at the fourth plenum um, of the 19th Central Committee in late October, uh, the uh, uh, resolution or the, the, uh, the declaration of the plenum for the first time devoted a full paragraph to Hong Kong. So most of the elements of the um, national security law were already there. Um, so, uh, and then of course, uh, it, it may be, well, in January, we had the replacements of two important people in the Hong Kong and Macau bureaucracy, the head of the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office in Beijing and the head of the Central Liaison Office in Hong Kong. Um, and perhaps originally the national security law was supposed to be um, adopted in as early as February or March in the uh, uh, usual uh, uh, time uh, for the um, uh, two assemblies, but uh, may, might have been delayed by COVID or perhaps uh, the, 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 the kerfluffle around um, the delaying in LegCo of the national anthem law um, uh, created an additional incentive. This we may never know. Um, but the fact is that in May it was uh, presented. I mean, the principle was adopted by the NPC and then it was published on and adopted on June 30th. Um, but uh, the, beyond the proximate cause, what I want to point out, and I know I'm, I, I don't have much time left, is that um, it, this law reflects a whole set of underlying tensions in one country, two systems, uh, an ongoing erosion of the high degree of autonomy of Hong Kong, which we've seen over um, many years. And in particular, it crystallizes three areas that we have seen slipping away from uh, Hong Kong's autonomy, which are uh, the prosecution, the police, and the immigration. And these three areas very clearly have been um, uh, under stronger and stronger influence from Beijing, whether this is delivered through direct interventions or through public opinion pressure through the pro-Beijing media. Um, but now this has become institutionalized. So the prosecution, in fact, is institutionalized. And immigration, we also have this rumor of a special immigration office to deal with, uh, in particular, foreign journalists. Um, but beyond, so, so what I would, I think I, I will say, I will put my main conclusion out here in case I get cut off. So uh, Zhang Shigong said one other important thing, um, which is that the basic law for too long has been seen as a kind of defensive tool to defend Hong Kong's autonomy. And Beijing needs to change its thinking about the basic law. The basic law can be redefined as a tool to uh, become an offensive law to in fact um, uh, assert Beijing's substantive control um, in Hong Kong. And I would go even a little further and say, uh, this is not only a project for Hong Kong, but this is also a project for China. So in this sense, this is not an incidental law at all. Um, uh, in the aftermath of Xi Jinping's uh, rise to power and the, uh, um, uh, uh, in, in 2012 and 2013, we, we saw this document number nine that was published and the seven areas that were singled out for um, control by the Chinese state, uh, constitutionalism, universal values, civil society, neoliberalism, Western journalism, historical nihilism, and questioning the party and socialism, all of these were now outlawed. So uh, Hong Kong, of course, concentrates all of those things. All of those discourses, they are all concentrated in Hong Kong. So uh, this, this, this need to reassert uh, the validity of central policy in Hong Kong is connected to uh, Xi Jinping's project for uh, China uh, as a whole. So um, I would say I, I won't have time to 
go into details, but it opens up a kind of view in which national security and ideological control pay, play a stronger central role in governance, paying less attention to formal structures, uh, uh, institutions that have been established over the years, more attention to controlling um, uh, ideology and discipline. And in particular, as Tsang shu also wrote, um, uh, uh, this was in an article that he wrote after the 19th Congress um, that Xi Jinping is trying to establish a new system for comprehensive party leadership of the state. So I think the NSL, Hong Kong's NSL is one component in the establishment of this comprehensive system for party leadership over the state. And I'll stop there, sorry for overrun. Thank you, Sebastian. No, no, you, you were just spot on uh, in seven minutes. Uh, now, since you have, uh, uh, I think the essence of your core um, uh, argument is that this is not just a project for Hong Kong, but this is also a project for China. And since uh, uh, we know that you have been uh, also uh, studying and uh, writing about the intellectual history of modern and contemporary China. So my question to you uh, is, uh, that uh, in the context of that this is more uh, uh, I mean, a statement or an experiment for uh, China in a larger in the larger canvas than just Hong Kong. Could you please uh, very briefly uh, tell us about, you know, the debates uh, in China? I know. I mean, uh, some people might not uh, accept this that there could be a debate in China on Hong Kong, but there are. I have seen a lot of commentaries uh, on the mainstream media as well as on the uh, social media also. For example, one of the slogans has been mentioned by many Chinese commentators, uh, keeping in mind what you said that this is more a project for China, that uh, that the Hong Kong should be now uh, eco each one country, one system, rather than one country, two system. So uh, would you please elaborate on this? Um. I'm not sure to what extent there is a really uh, active debate on Hong Kong uh, beyond sort of very specialized circles. I mean, it's true that um, uh, we got some uh, sort of some information um, about the legal experts, the legal discussions that took place between experts. There were various symposia that were held in Beijing in uh, May and June to discuss the, uh, the, the, the details of the national security law. And there was some debate in these, in these symposia. So not, not everyone is, not, not all of the legal experts are on the same um, page. Um, but I'm not sure that those debates really, really find their way uh, into, into broader discussion. Now, it's true that um, I think one thing that's maybe overstated in um, Western media is, uh, well, in Chinese media too, of course, but that goes without saying, but is the fact that um, public opinion in China is somehow very critical of Hong Kong. I think this is, um, this is there's not much uh, base for this judgment. Uh, um, it, it's, it's always very hard to assess public opinion in China to begin with, and all of the sort of weak, weak signals that we're getting from China show us that, um, things are not as simple and in particular of course people with a more liberal inclination um, in China uh, feel that Hong Kong has an important role to play. Um, uh, well Hong Kong has always been China's uh, uh, offshore public sphere, the place that published uh, hundreds of newspapers, books uh, that established autonomous universities where people leaving China found a place whether in 1949 or in 1990. Um, so uh, many many in particular intellectual um, groups, I mean, you, academics and so on are very attached to this role of Hong Kong. Um, others also hope that the Hong Kong legal system can influence uh, China more. Uh, but um, uh, to what extent there is a really robust debate about that, I'm not sure. What there is more robust debate about, and I'll stop there, is the, the project for China. So of course, no one openly challenges Xi Jinping's uh, project within China, but um, certainly we are seeing some pushback against uh, uh, this kind of very, um, uh, very, uh, 
I would say, across the board, power politics or kind of Darwinian approach to international relations that uh, the current leadership has uh, adopted. So um, whether in a tactical kind of formulation saying that China would be better served by a more modest and uh, more kind of time abiding posture or, uh, or because people are dissatisfied with certain decisions of the leadership, I think there, we have some, um, again, weak signals uh, of, of sort of critical voices on, on, on that. Thank you, Sebastian. It's always a pleasure to, you know, to be educated by your very incisive and insightful observations. Thank you so much. Uh, let, me, let me now turn to Victoria. Victoria, the floor is yours for next seven minutes. Okay, thank you so much. Well, first of all, don't really call us uh, the Gang of Four because the national security law exercises extraterritorial jurisdiction and then you could get us executed. So <laughs> now this also then gets us to basically national security law. I think we should really understand it not in terms of national security, but regime security. It's really about the CCP's own regime security and going back to what um, Sebastian was saying. And then uh, while uh, Chang Shigong, they want to, to see this as, you know, kind of sorting out and strengthening, restructuring the, the basic law. Um, Jerry Cohen, who's pretty much the dean of China, China's law, he said on July 1st, this is a total takeover of Hong Kong. This is no, no longer a handover, but a takeover. And then at another uh, Hong Kong youth seminar, Maria Tam, who of course understands how things work in China and has the years of Beijing leaders, said that you know if there's any, whenever according to China's legislation law, a law that is more recent, that is more specific, always overrides the previous law. So Michael Davis says that this really the national security law means that this means a fundamental change in Hong Kong's constitutional structure. The original basic law is basically already input in the trash can. So how did we get to here? I I would say that um, one thing you know going back kind of to, going back to also what Sebastian was saying, and I think I want to just briefly say what happened last year and how we should understand the crackdown that led up to the national security law. Last at the end of July last year that the PLA released these videos showing riot drill in urban like setting, Hong Kong like urban setting. And then they also um, practice more drills across the border in Shenzhen. Now at the time, many people, I think both in Hong Kong and, and uh, in the rest of the world kind of underestimated China's determination. Everyone, many people thought that no, China is not going to really roll out military tanks into Hong Kong because if they do so, that would, that would mean the formal end of one country, two systems. And as such, then uh, China would also lose all the benefits that you could get from Hong Kong. Well, the thing though is that I think people didn't really get the full lessons from the Tenement crackdown and also what happened afterwards, um, China's stability maintenance, that even in Chengdu in 1989, Beijing did not really roll out military tanks to suppress uh, the protest. They used regular police, they used regular security forces, they beat people to death. And then uh, they also fomented riots in the sense that, for example, that there was this market and it was mysteriously set on fire. And then another element was then the construction of the truth. And they created these pamphlets, these booklets, and, and emphasizing that look at these rioters, then you are just here to restore law and order. Now, I'm basically these points about Chengdu is really all taken from uh, journalist Louisa Lim in her book on the, the People's Republic of Amnesia. Another aspect of, of the Tiananmen model is the imposition of amnesia through censorship and, and, um, and, and brainwashing, patriotic education. So this is how we can see all of these actually tenement like elements in Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, they didn't really use, they did not have to roll out military tax, but they subverted Hong Kong's police force. And then it was not, not very difficult to foment riots in the in the sense that because a lot of people, you you just deny people their right to nonviolent means of protest. For example, in Hong Kong, in order to protest, you have to apply for a permit from the police. And no objection permit. Without that, then 
if people still show up, then you're like vulnerable to the charge of unlawful assembly. And if you also deny people, if you know people form human chain, they uh, they sing songs and then they put up London walls with sticky notes. They launch strikes. They uh, launch class boycotts. They launch consumer boycotts. If you call all of those activities as undercutting the bottom line one country two systems, the people are arrested or they they are attacked by thugs. And even a lot of those London wall installations were taken down and by by say, government workers and then uh, with right police standing by to watch, make sure that, you know, things actually get taken down. And when all means of nonviolence resistance is criminalized or denied, it was easy for young people to then conclude. So July, on July 1st, one of the graffitis uh, on the electrical building, when people storm into to the electrical building, it's you, Carrie Lam, who taught us that nonviolent uh, protests do not work. And when that, then it became very easy for people to begin throwing bricks and rocks and, and escalating to Molotov cocktails. And then once protesters, they began to do that, it became very easy for the police and any agent provocateurs to turn up the heat. Uh, at the height of you know, the violence that there are many cases that are very suspicious. For example, when all the train stations were closed down by the police because the police by the after the after the end of August, they every time that there were there, there was any planned protest, the police would just come in and close down the uh, MTR and metro stations. And then there were these images of very extensive burning and and vandalism of train stations. But how could that happen if the the police already occupied these stations? And who could be in, in the stations to do the damage? And then we also have pictures of you know, broken glasses. They're all on the outside of the station. So how could people from the outside you know, create this kind of damage? Or there was also another viral image of um, people with face masks and, and, and vandalize a, a through train. Now, the curious thing is that through train usually do not stop. Um, they go straight from Guangzhou to the Hong Kong terminal why that incident happened in this, at the station of Fanling. And two, three trains don't usually stop there. And curiously too, is that Hong Kong's, uh, the Hong Kong Police Tactical Unit is based in Fanling only within minutes of walking distance. So there are a lot of these very curious things, but then the thing is that once, um, you know, because protesters were masked, and, and so once, once that you have, the protesters side began to also conclude that it, you know, violence doesn't work, it became very easy for the, for the authorities to foment riots. So another part about the truth that's going on in Hong Kong is that um, one of the five demands is to have an independent investigation into police violence and for police brutality. And, and at the same time, also an investigation into the Yunlong incident, uh, into the Yunlong incident on July 21st, that day when these white shirted thugs attacked passengers and passes by and just residents. And now we got the opposite truth that, well, not only that those guys are not uh, punished, but the guy, the legislator who was just making high fives to these thugs and he just got rewarded with you know, one of the Bohemia uh, awards. And then the victims who were beaten to, to, to with bloody faces and now arrested for rioting. So this is essentially creating an alternative truth. The last part is to is censorship and and um, and patriotic education. So schools, you know, you are not allowed to talk about politics. Liberal studies are going to be revamped, and teachers who who have any pro democracy tendency, they are going to be fired. And the one thing I would say is that how so Beijing has really succeeded to a very large extent in this tenement-like crackdown in Hong Kong. So now how, how far this can go, the last part is going to be really difficult because you know, how do you remote a whole generation when the police have arrested people as young as 11 and many are in the 20s and, and or the late teens. So you have an entire generation completely alienated. How do you remote them? At the same time, the Hong Kong society is also already highly organized 
So, and also you have a society who have uh, carry on the fire of tenement. So as soon as, you know, the, uh, uh, a legislator who was also beaten up in, uh, in Yunnan on July, July 21st last year. He was arrested for rioting that day. The people immediately changed the slogan from never forget June 4 to never forget July 21st. So this is a society that that's very difficult for the regime to impose in Russia. And then, but then um, another thing that's worrisome is- um, how I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll have to stop you here because- okay. Uh, so uh, very quickly, uh, my question to you would be uh, that you, uh, I'll combine what you presented to us today and also what you sent us as your synopsis, that you mentioned that uh, two slogans, which was today's Tiananmen is tomorrow's Hong Kong in 1989, and today's uh, Xinjiang or Tibet is tomorrow's Hong Kong in 2020. So uh, uh, combining that with what you told us today about the repression carried out by the Beijing authorities. And uh, I think uh, if I'm not wrong, since last year, over 10,000 people have already been arrested. And in the last month itself, there have been 300, more than 300 arrests. And just 24 hours ago, there have been three more arrests. So, uh, so my question to you is that in this backdrop, I mean, you also mentioned about, since you have been studying also the, uh, the democracy uh, movement in Hong Kong, even prior to the return of Hong Kong to the mainland China. Can you, for a better perspective, can you tell us also something about uh, the uh, scale and the intensity of democracy movements taking place in Hong Kong before 1997, especially during the Chris Patton uh, governor, when he was the governor? Uh, could you tell us about that? Yes, so, and it was Hong Kong people were not consulted, they were not involved during the Sino British negotiations. During all the various rounds, the only thing that we knew was that the, you know, this latest round was useful and constructive, nothing more. Hong Kong people panicked. But then when the uh, Sino British Joint Declaration was signed, people sighed a relief. Oh, okay, it's not so bad. You know, it's Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong with a high degree of autonomy. I was transitioning from secondary school to college at the time. And there was this, actually, people were very optimistic. Oh, so we could write our future. And then in 1987, I would say that Hong Kong's democracy movement was born in, 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 in a Gaoshan uh, 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 gathering. And I actually went there and it was a time when all these social workers and teachers and, and professors and lawyers who were very interested in, you know, kind of like maybe we can help write the future all gathered at the same time. And then it was kind of just a loose structure, nothing really came out of it. But then 1989 came, Tenement came. That got everyone together and 1.5 million Hong Kong people poured to the street. And that at the same time, I think is also, it also lays down kind of the bad birth of the, of the one country to systems model because Hong Kong people learn from that incident that if they could kill their own people, what would they do to Hong Kong later on? So Hong Kong people became very convinced that we would need democracy to preserve our pre-existing ways of life. Beijing learned the opposite lesson that, you know, that Beijing has to deny Hong Kong democracy and kill Hong Kong's pre-existing freedoms. The question was how to do this, and with the national security law, we're seeing the combination of this. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let us now turn to uh, Samson Yuen. Uh, you have your seven minutes now. Please sure. can I share my screen? I have a presentation. Um, okay. So thanks very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, thanks uh, ICS for putting up this uh, very meaningful seminar. Uh, so I, I, I agree with uh, the previous two speakers, Sebastian and Victoria's points, but I would like to use a slightly different perspective to look at uh, Hong Kong, uh, which is to, uh, uh, to show you some data basically to look at uh, what is Hong Kong like uh, and what is the impact of the uh, protests and also the national security law on uh, Hong Kong civilians uh recently basically okay so uh so there are a few puzzles that i have been thinking uh there's been a discussion here in hong kong uh whether the protests last year have officially ended because from time to time we still see some protests going on so there's some debate whether we should call the protests an official end 
what are the legacies and the traces of the protests? And can we see any dissent going on in Hong Kong? And what kind of, how is it being transformed into? And uh, I, I would also like to look at the impact of the NSL on the broader Hong Kong society as a whole. So if you look at this, this is the uh, basically the number of protest events over the past, well, actually from March 2019 to February 20, 2020. So you can see that the height of the movement was around August to September. And after December, it kind of died down. And then of course we have COVID. Uh, so after February, everything kind of quieted down. Uh, and then only until I think in, 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 in July that the protests came up again, but the size of the protests were uh, extremely tiny. So, um, this is a, a summary of the number of protests that I found on, uh, on the news. Um, basically, these are protests, of just a few people or, you know, at most 20 or 50 people. The only big protest was uh, the 1st of July, which is the very start, very, uh, very beginning of this, this, this chart on the, on the left hand side. Uh, and on July 1st, which is the uh, Hanover anniversary, we, we did have a, had, had a pretty big protest, but of course, just like today on October 1st, the protest um, was met with very ha heavy pro police repression and also presence. So everybody who were on the streets, were uh, they were condoned up by the police and also stop and search. And today, 60 people were arrested. So the same, pretty much the same happened on July 1st. Uh, so if you look at this comparison here, so I, I just try to average out the number of protests per day, you can see that indeed the height of the protest was uh, September, October, and right, so I, I didn't do, do the uh, uh, data collection in, in this red box, but what we found is that in the past three months, the number of protests, the average number of protests per day is extremely low. Okay, and this doesn't really take into account the number of people participating in it. If we look at the number of people, I think it, it's even smaller. Okay, so uh, well, even though um, the grievance is still quite strong, the dissent is very strong in Hong Kong. I'm afraid that you know the 2019 protests have um, have come to an end, um, unfortunately. Uh, and. Uh, Next slide. So this is the July 1st protest. And of course, you can see already see that there is a lot of space uh, and, and there isn't a very large turnout simply because the cost of protest has increased a lot. You can be arrested uh, simply for carrying a sign that contains slogans for, uh, for um, contravening the national security law. OK, very easily you will get arrested. Uh, and uh, these are the what protests in the past three, three months normally look like. So basically there's always this guy in the center. Uh, his nickname is called Brother Lunch because he always order, uh, organized lunch protests. And he's only a secondary school student, <laughs> interestingly. He's very, very young. So uh, the way he organized protests, he, he goes out and he reads an Apple Daily newspaper and sit there and a lot of police will surround him. Okay, and this is how protests are like in the past few few months. Uh, the the cost of uh, of going out is, is really high. But even though you know grievances are still there, um, the protests are not happening. It it wasn't like last year, in in two thousand nineteen. Um, to shed more light on the impact of the national security law on the population, so I rely on a survey that uh, my research team did. Uh, in early August. Uh, so it's a population survey. It's not just a survey on protesters. So uh, basically relying on uh, landline, also mobile phone. So uh, the sample is 800 people. Um, and the results uh, shows that uh, this is the political consumption, okay? Because there is this trend of uh, people moving protests into the market arena. Okay, so since last year, actually during the 2019 protests, uh, a lot of people are uh, boycotting uh, shops or companies that supposedly support the government and they are boycotting, you know, buying stuff or uh, going to restaurants that are pro-movement, are explicitly pro-movement. 
So this become a viable way for people to continue to immerse themselves in, in protesting and in activism. And we can see that the difference between here is the supporters and non-supporters of the protest. Obviously, you know, over 50% of the supporters, they, they say that, you know, they, they very frequently engage in um, the activity of boycotting and also boycotting. Uh, and at the same time, you know, uh, a bit fewer people uh, encourage others to boycott and boycott. Uh, and at the same time, they also promote boycott and boycott information, uh, the, the information about boycott and boycotting. So, for example, sending information of a restaurant or a shop to your friend uh, that you have to support it because it's pro movement. Um, it's, it's a form of protest that is still going on in the city, even today, because I was out at the market today, today and uh, it, there was long lines in these what we call yellow restaurants, yellow being the color that are supportive of the protest last year. Very long line, I even spot police, uh, you know, plain close, close police. Uh, they were patrolling around and seeing if there were signs hanging out in those shops uh, and whether people were gathering uh, in those shops. Um, so this form of protest is still going on. It's still pretty strong. It's very, very strong. Uh, and uh, I, I'm actually very interested in this phenomenon of the yellow economic circle because seemingly uh, it, it becomes kind of the fallback option for Hong Kong people to carry on their protests. And it's very interesting because it seems that capitalism or the, the market is the last resort of people, uh, that they, they can only express themselves through the market choices. Okay, so the, the act of consumption becomes uh, some sort of act of dissent. Uh, and also, you know, if you talk to the young people, especially you, you'll see that they, 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 they boycott uh, the, the pro-government shops. Uh, I should go faster. Um, so uh, what, what worries me is the intention to migrate. Uh, there is a 50% um, of the supporters say they do have the intention of to migrate and 25% of them really had plans to migrate. And what surprises me is the non-supporters of the movement. Actually, there are a, a, a substantial group of people who, who said that they intend to migrate. And I think, um, this really shows you a better picture because uh, if you want to migrate in Hong Kong, you have to get a certificate of no criminal conviction. Okay, so the orange line is the number of people getting the, that certificate last year. Okay, and of course we have COVID, which kind of uh, pr presses down the number. So imagine if this reopens again, I think this will be really high. So a lot of people are actually leaving the city, voting by their feet, um, and uh, and. Uh, when we asked them what was the reason, 75% uh, about said that is related to the NSL. Uh, and I think what is most worrying is the, uh, is the you know, they, when they migrate, they will transfer out their funds. So uh, this is a comparison between people who have the intention to migrate and who don't have the uh, intention to migrate. So uh, almost half of the people want to transfer out their funds. Uh, and even among those people with no intention to migrate, there's a substantial amount of people who wants to transfer out their funds from Hong Kong. And I think this has a huge implication on Hong Kong's role as an international financial center. Maybe I'll stop there. Um, and I think that basic, my, the basic conclusion is that the NSL really had a huge impact on civil, uh, citizen attitude. And also, uh, uh, and also we can see that the scent is still there but the problem is that it's really hard to, for people to, there's no opportunity for people to organize big protests again. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Samson. Uh, it was really very helpful and it's very difficult to consume in such a quick time, the wonderful uh, data and survey you conducted with your team, research team. Uh, now, since you mentioned also about uh, the uh, number of protesters thinning down on the streets, and also you mentioned about, uh, you brought in words like capitalism and market, etc. Mm -hmm. So My question to you is in two parts. One quick part is that uh, 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 there are different perspectives on why the number of protesters uh, is dwindling in size mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I mean, I've seen even debates in among uh, some commentators in Beijing uh, or in China who have been writing that perhaps uh, repression or repressive policies is not the answer to solve the Hong Kong uh, problem. 
and uh, on the other hand there are also perspectives who argue that one of the reasons why the protesters have thinned down especially post uh, uh, 1st of july since the nsl was imposed that many people are disappointed in the sense that they think that the pan democratic alliance is concerned more with the expectations of the foreign forces to continue the agitation for demanding democracy etc etc whereas the real issues are nobody nobody is paying attention to the real issues which have been there for decades more than two decades now for example mm. un unemployment low wages or stagnant wages mm -hmm. or cost of living or unaffordable housing especially for the younger people who enter the employment uh, mm -hmm. Um, force, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that, uh, as you yourself also said, that number of protest protesters have really come down uh, drastically? Do you think that this is the beginning of the death of democracy movement in Hong Kong? Well, uh, I think I think uh, the the movement. Of course, now the, uh, the NSL is um, it's 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 a very new thing. So as as best, I agree with what Sebastian said. It's a reorganization. I even say. A kind of social re-engineering of the city, um, and but 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 um, that right now this moment actually reminds me of what happened after the umbrella movement or Occupy Central movement after 2014, and at that time it also looks like there is no hopes the democracy movement has ended, uh, and. And that time is even worse. And it's it's the people, it's the protesters who do not want to participate anymore because of uh, the, this internal split among them. Um, but right now, I don't think that's the case. So the you know we see the number of protesters going down. Um, I think it's it's to, it's uh, you know a lot of it is related to the increased uh, more intense repression. Uh, very very high cost of, of, of repression and uh, and and secondly there's also no kind of political opportunities unlike in last year where there is obviously there's a clear target which is the extradition bill and also the the five demands uh, uh, you know addressing police violence that sort of issue but right now people don't really see any kind of opportunity but instead they're they're actually thinking about their life under the NSL and how to reorganize their life and whether to transfer out their funds. So uh, I, th I think even though people are not on the street, it doesn't mean that there is no grievances. The, the latent grievances are, are extremely strong, I would say. And I, I, I think it's a personal feeling here. Uh, it's not just related to politics. It's, it's a feeling that, you know, that the kind of public in Hong Kong is kind of completely changing. Uh, uh, the public as in you know get there there's kind of a shared uh sense that uh we, we belong to the same city there's something to celebrate about in the city you know like mid autumn festival there's a public we go out to to the park but but i really feel that from last year onwards and especially this year this kind of public has has is gone you know nobody goes to see the same movie <laughs> nobody goes out to, to do the same events basically so i think this is really it shows that this people don't are, are, they they don't know what to do basically they're 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 kind of uh, uh reorganizing their lives and uh, and of course there are a lot of unsolved issues like unemployment and of course the youth unemployment right now in hong kong is, is very high like the rest of the world um but over time, people have learned that these kind of economic issues are deeply connected with the political issues. So that's why we see that there aren't a lot of uh, overt economic demands, simply because they are kind of inserted there underneath those political demands. And they believe that people believe that you can only achieve those economic demands through uh, a, a better political system. Thank you. Thank you, Samson. That was really very uh, uh, enlightening and uh, you really exposed us to the real issues uh, as part of the ongoing uh, political uh, struggle and political movement in Hong Kong. Thank you so much. Now, uh, let me invite um, our uh, fourth and the final speaker of the evening, Ilaria. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you very much for um organizing this panel and uh, for moderating it. And also thank you very much to my three 
preceding speakers for their very interesting comments that really helped me to introduce my section of this conversation, which is going to be about how much the national security law has impacted journalism. And uh, when we talk about what is the role, the international role of Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong has been for a long time a base for, um, for international journalists and also for Chinese language journalists to both follow what was going on in China during the times when China was more inaccessible and, uh, and also as a very convenient base for whomever wanted to follow the entire region. So both for its uh, very central position in East Asia and uh, its um, easy connectivity and uh, very convenient airport, very convenient transportation, Hong Kong has been for many years the headquarters of many international um, media and newspapers from all over the world and has had some uh, very important local publications, whether in English or Chinese. Now, with the national security laws introduction, a lot of people suddenly felt that this role was seriously endangered, not only because of possible consequences of what people would be writing themselves, but also because the national security law has introduced a kind of legal language into the Hong Kong jurisdiction that is uh, extremely vague. And this vagueness itself is, I think, part and parcel of the, um, the scope of the law to leave a very ample room for uncertainty so that people will have to make their own calculation, their own risk calculation, and decide how much they feel they can write in the case of journalism, how much they can ask or how much they can say to a publication. The other thing that we have to bear in mind while we look at the way um, this, this new enhanced form of censorship has now intervened on the Hong Kong scene is that the national security law aspires to be um, applied worldwide. So there is, uh, it's not just the Hong Kong jurisdiction that is going to be subjected to some of um, these new uh, subjected to these uh, new provisions, but potentially someone who is publishing in India, in uh, in Paris, in New York, um, could also be um, accused of breaking the national security law. So there have been a number of immediate uh, changes to how um, reporters have started functioning, and uh, one of the immediate changes had those slogans, for example, that have been defined by the police as being in breach of the law, um, could be in breach of the law even if they are reported, even if, even if it's in between inverted commas as a quote. And uh, we now see a lot of publications that are shying from printing um, some of the most common slogans or some of the most common themes that are um, that, that have been characterized in the protests last year. And so um, the other thing that has really sparked a very strong reaction, even if it's a reaction that we have seen mostly online or on social media, um, has been the arrest on national security law ground of uh, Jimmy Lai, who is the uh, publisher of publisher and founder of Apple Daily, which has always been the most uh, staunchly and most openly pro-democracy newspapers here in Hong Kong. It's a Chinese language newspaper that now has also um, enhanced and expanded its uh, English language section in order to have um, to, to be a bridge and to be able to um, to be a voice of Hong Kong even abroad. But on uh, August 11th, Jimmy Lai was arrested. He has now been released on bail, and he was um, the his offices were um, raided by police, who did this kind of very open, very very disturbing uh, show of going through files, going through. Uh, material on reporters' desks. One finding that under the national security law, anything is possible. So 
something can be searched even if there is no search warrant for it and someone can be um, then accused of having um, having had, for example, seditious motives for something that was on their desk, even if it wasn't used. And um, once again, we have seen a economic reaction on the part of Hong Kong people. Their, their shock at the arrest of Jimmy Lai translated into a sudden decision to buy stock of uh, up the, of the Apple Group, which went very high, and then people realized that this was just um, a show of support, but the money wasn't really going into Apple Daily's coffers itself. And Apple Daily has been um, in a kind of economic dire straits for a long time because there is a um, any company who wants to be on China's good side cannot advertise on Apple Daily. So ever since that, we have seen this, uh, this transfer of what Victoria was referring to the Lennon walls, which are this kind of uh, spontaneous walls made with, uh, covered with post-its with uh, special messages of uh, support for the protests. And uh, they have now become very rare. Most of them have been destroyed either by police or in some cases by pro-government supporters. And uh, now the front page of Apple Daily has become a sort of um, Lennon wall because many people have been buying advertisements on the Apple Daily, sometimes very small ones, sometimes full page advertisements, both as a way of keeping on um, this channel of free expression, but also for support of uh, Apple Daily. We have also seen in other cases, um, the, the, the case of the RTHK, which is the independent public broadcaster that had been set up in a way a bit like the BBC in, uh, in colonial times. And RTHK has always been a bit at the forefront of a different way of conceiving the media, one in which uh, a public broadcaster has total editorial independence and another in which if it is a public broadcaster it means it has to be the voice of the government so the government both in Beijing and in Hong Kong have been pushing for RTHK to become a kind of a tool of the government and uh, um, the journalists that are working there who remain independent journalists who have however um, a contract as civil servants who have been pushing to uh, keep their editorial independence. We have now seen a series of um, attacks against this editorial independence. The very latest one is a long review of the contract of Nabela Kosser, who is a um, Hong Kong journalist of Pakistani descent who has been uh, singled out by a number of uh, cri um, critical emails after she was asking some uh, very determined, very precise questions to, uh, to Carrie Lam and to other members of the government during press conferences. And uh, for this, she has now been on a, on a long review that has lasted more than a, than a year and has just been renewed for 120 more days. So going after, very specific going after uh, those reporters who had become uh, kind of heroes of the movement because her had um, also shown and ha had become one of those, let's say, um, heroes of the um, anti-extradition bill movement, which also had the, um, the role of underlining that Hong Konger is not an ethnicity. And that is something that um, the, the protesters have been, have been very keen on saying that Hong Konger is anyone who loves Hong Kong. Um, I, am, I think I, I should be wrapping up my, um, my intervention here, uh, saying that both because of the, the specific attacks on some media outlets and because of this huge uncertainty that the national security law lives on active reporters, the um, national security laws had a huge impact on one of Hong Kong's traditional roles in China and in the world. And this traditional role has become has come even more under, um, under attack or under questioning now that the police has published a new ordinance that tries to uh, determine 
who is and who isn't a journalist. And once again, we have extremely vague guidelines that leave re and um, media organizations in a very vulnerable position. Okay, uh, thank you, Ilaria. That was really <clears throat> very illuminating. Um, I actually had a long question to ask you, but uh, because of the shortage of time, I will skip that. And um, instead, I will uh, very quickly ask you a very short question that um, uh, since uh, none of the four speakers have uh, talked about the what happens to the unlawful extension of LETCO for one more year, so could you, could you talk about that, especially the 22 opposition lawmakers? I mean, what is their situation? Uh, aren't they providing legitimacy to LECCO if it continues like this for one more year? This has, um, I think, as we said in the introduction, there has been a strong division among pro-democracy legislators on what to do about this extension for one year. And, um, there are two things of note uh, about this. One is that uh, there are now three members of LEGCO that have decided to step down and uh, not continue into what they see as a illegitimate uh, legislature. But the other thing is that there is a precedent to this and the precedent was in, from 97 to 98, there was what was called the provisional legislature and uh, that was, in a way um, an even worse outlet because it was made nearly uh, entirely of unelected legislators who had been appointed because China had refused to accept the previous legislature that had been um, returned by the highest percentage of universal suffrage. Now, unfortunately, everything that um, involves LegCo is quite technical because it's a pretty complicated system. But so what is going to happen now is that there is, uh, for one more year at least, we have a legislature that is only partially legitimate. And uh, at the same time, those who have decided to remain are doing so not only because of that, rather thin margin of preference from those who took part in the, but also because the idea is that in a skewed system like the one that we have now, um, it's better to be part of any decision that can be taken and that will have an impact on the population instead of trying to, let's say be pure in a system that is not pure, in a system that is, um, it's twisted from the very beginning. So this has been what people were struggling with. Having said that, we have to remember that the, that LegCo does not have the power to propose new laws. This has happened since 98, when the first chief executive, Tun Shihua, decided that LegCo would only um, have the power to approve or reject or ask questions to the government for laws that were proposed by the executive. So LegCo has had more members returned by universal suffrage in the past 23 years. However, they have also had uh, less and less real power and influence in the running of the, uh, of the city. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elaria. Uh, as you can see now that I'm a very inefficient timekeeper. And uh, since we are now <laughs> almost uh, exceeded one hour of discussion, I think uh, if you all agree and with due apologies, let us skip uh, that segment where I thought that each speaker can ask the fellow speaker a question. Instead, let us go into the Q&A round. And if we have time left from this round, then we can come back to you either asking you to ask a question to the fellow speaker or we'll give you one or two minutes at the end if you had some final comments to make. So with this, I open the discussion now to Q&A. And since I don't see any raised hands, uh, anybody is free to ask a question. Uh, uh, yes. Um, Yes, uh, Ambassador Yogendra Kumar. Ambassador Yogendra Kumar, you can ask yes. your question, yeah. 
thank you. Uh, my question actually relates to the basic law. And my question actually is, uh, to what extent is the basic law an act of the National People's Congress? And to what extent was the text of the basic law part of a larger legally enforceable agreement between the UK and China at the time of the transfer of power? Because, I mean, this question is being asked repeatedly. I mean, let's say Chinese government say that this is an internal matter. And let's say the foreign governments are saying, actually it is not because China is duty bound not to touch the basic law, which actually is a result of some kind of an agreement between UK and China. Thank you. So uh, who, who will take this question out of the four of you quickly? Okay. Okay, yeah, so yeah. I'll give you a few words to that. Um, well, the, the basic law grows out of the joint declaration, the sino british Joint Declaration of 1984. Um, the basic law itself is, of course, a national law. It's, it's, not a, it's, it's not an international treaty. The international treaty is the joint declaration. Um, but insofar as the basic law grows out of the joint declaration, it um, encapsulates certain promises and it, it enshrines certain promises that were made in the joint declaration as an international treaty lodged with the UN into Chinese law. So um, certain, uh, I mean, the various essays have been written to detail um, how certain infringing on certain aspects of the basic law it will also entail an infringement on the joint declaration. So, um, well, one, one, one example, for example, is that um, uh, the joint declaration uh, enshrines that Hong Kong will have right of final adjudication. The Hong Kong judiciary will have the right of final adjudication. So um, if this is uh, durably infringed upon, then that is uh, uh, indeed a, a violation of an international treaty. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, um, Next, anyone would like to speak and uh, ask the question? Just announce your name and uh, whom the question is addressed to and ask your question, please. Uh, may I ask one question? I am Madhu. Yeah, please. And uh, my, specify. Uh, to whom you are asking the question? Yes, yes, I'm. I'm uh, specifically asking the uh, the third speaker who had shown the slides. Uh, Samson, okay. Samson, yeah. So uh, I'm a keen follower of what is happening in uh, Hong Kong and how it is coming out to be with uh, China. So uh, what I want to know is that there have been very novel ways of protest among the Hong Kong protesters, which I have been watching. Like, you know, they could have, they use the lasers and they have been hiding faces. They have been make, using apps, you know, that could not uh, they avoid the cameras. And like this person uh, who sits and reads the newspaper, you know, in the middle of the uh, mall or in outside, like it's a high school student doing that. So uh, how far these protests and uh, the ways that have, they have been, uh, you know, articulating all these protests have now changed in the post COVID conditions or I mean, uh, they've just died down because of the reasons that have been cited. So I just wanted to know. Yeah, um, I, th I think COVID is, re I think it's a very important reason, you know, since the government are using COVID reasons to say that uh, people shouldn't get on the streets, they're, they're actually not using political reasons. They're using public health measures to uh, forbid people from protesting. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, and, 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 uh, and also, uh, so, so the number of people on the streets are, are much lower, plus the cost of the protests. Um, and uh, so last year, people have been heavily relying on uh, an internet forum, which is like Reddit. Um, and in Hong Kong, it's called Lingdang, L-I-H-K-G. Uh, so on, on, this forum, on this forum, people just brainstorm all kinds of very innovative ways to protest. Uh, and then after they discuss this, you know, these ideas, they take it to Telegram to, 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 to bring the discussion onwards and to execute them. So, uh, but unfortunately, these two platforms uh, are now under very heavy surveillance by the, by the police. 
Um, so for instance, some of the uh, administrators of the Telegram channels were arrested. Um, and, um, uh, and so, and also, you know, in, in LHKG as well. Um, so very heavily monitored communications. So the innovations can, couldn't be coming out again from there. So it seems that, and also the people relying on those channels are, are also going down. Um, so that's why the mode of protests um, we're now seeing is not that innovative anymore. Okay, it's basically like the leftover of last year. Uh, and today, actually, I just saw in the news, uh, there's one innovative protest. So uh, there is this protester taking out an Indian flag uh, in the middle of the road and uh, shouting solidarity with India. And, and actually nobody, you know, police didn't know what's going on. Why the Indian flag? <laughs> so he, he was left alone. And then he, he took out another fl flag, which is, uh, I think the, the Uyghurs, uh, the solidarity with the Uyghurs, I, I think that's the fact. Um, so, so yeah, so people are still doing all kinds of things to, to try to be innovative, uh, but it's hard. It's really hard under the present condition, under COVID and also under, under the police repression. Okay, so uh, Ambassador Ashok Kanta. Thank, thanks, Hemant. You know, let me first you know, thank all four panelists for excellent, uh, very illuminating presentations. So much to discuss. I had one question for Samson. Rather, I can ask two questions. One question about you know, uh, economic impact of sanctions which are being imposed uh, after you know, my introduction NSL by countries like USA. To what extent it will affect the uh, economy of Hong Kong? And a related question, to what extent will influence attitudes in the central government, central authorities in Beijing with regard to issues in Hong Kong? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I can only speculate the impact because we, it's really hard to observe it uh, since the, the, the sanctions have just kicked in. Um, I think, I mean, at least I, 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 some of the business class interests are definitely affected because uh, we, we are already seeing, you know, the, the list of the sanctions are not that long yet. You know, only 12 people were, I think 11 people were sanctioned, uh, but the implication is large because it means that a lot of pro-government businessmen or politicians, uh, the US banks are not willing to, uh, you know, do business with them or accept their, uh, the, the uh, you know uh, accept their money basically, so there. Uh, but but we don't know the extent of this impact yet because only a, a few of them have came out and said that it has impacted them, but uh, they they have been quite silent about it. So we don't know the actual you know the extent of impact, and I think the more obvious economic impact on Hong Kong is that uh, because the U.S. sanction one of the U.S. sanctions is that. Uh, things that are made in Hong Kong had to be changed to made in China. Okay, the the label. You know, when you buy things that is made in Hong Kong, and I, I do think that it, it it does have a, a huge impact on things you know manufactured in Hong Kong because those have to be say that they 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 are made in China and the branding of Hong Kong has has completely you know disappeared. Uh, so that that also have um, much wider impact on the business community in Hong Kong. And even though you know those those business might not necessarily be pro-government um, and they, they are also impact. And I, I, I don't know, uh, at least from what we observe that the, whether the uh, sanctions had an impact on, on Beijing and, and uh, to the opposite, it seems to have strengthened the, uh, Beijing's resolve. I mean, the determination to push forward with national security law, maybe they slow down a little bit, um, but, uh, but still, I think the trend is there. You know, as Sebastian uh, said earlier, I think the trend to have the NSL, it, it, it doesn't, maybe the speed has maybe related to the sanctions, but the, the trend, the longer term trend is still there. You know, they, they wanted to impose the national security law despite the cost, because they, they, they could have well calculated that the sanctions would be coming, but then they still, uh, they still decided to accept the cost. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, since uh, uh, before I invite the next question, let me also clarify if the speakers are agreeable, 
although we have almost completed our time, but we can have uh, 10, 10 minutes more for q and if the, if the speakers are available for another 10 minutes, then we can take some more questions. And uh, I would like to now shift to the written questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions and they are addressed to all four of you. Whoever wishes to respond uh, can please uh, raise your hand and start answering the question. I'll read out the question. Mm -hmm. First question is, uh, is there any link seen between the pace of integration and the construction of the Big Bay Urban Economic Region, bringing together, together Kwangtung, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, and Hong Kong. Are Hong Kong business, businesses worried that any show of resistance in Hong Kong will affect their business in the mainland, given the deep links across the Bay? That is the first question. And the second one is, uh, um, the questioner is asking for a comment that the image of China is as bad as it was in the aftermath of 1989. So China on the verge of perpetual collapse was always something that the outside world has com was comfortable with. However, since China is faring well and at par with the capitalist systems, it is always subjected to intense skepticism. Kindly comment. And the third question uh, uh, is that, um, that is <clears throat> from Michael, Kolakowski, how much of a factor was worsening social security in driving the overall discontent in Hong Kong society in the way to the 2019-2020 developments? So we have this set of three questions. If you have heard the question and uh, you've understood them, please feel free to respond uh, to the questions. Yes, Victoria. I take the second question, China's image now, is it as bad as it was after the Tiananmen? I would say that it, it, it is because um, all of those years until last year, every year, whether it, we're talking about the US uh, Department of State or the UK Foreign Office, they repeatedly every year that the report on Hong Kong is like, oh, um, there may be these uh, uh, Pretty awful violations, for example, the abduction of bookseller Li Bo, Li Bo out of Hong Kong to, and taking across the border. But on the whole, one country, two systems are still working well. But in, not until last year. And so then in the Hong Kong, uh, in the US, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act was tabled for five years. And every year, it was always basically could not even be tabled because of business lobby. And it was really Beijing's repression of Hong Kong last year that finally got the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act passed. And even then, because you know, a lot of these European countries don't really like to follow Trump, they have a lot, you know, because Trump's policies hurt them as much as they hurt China. So European countries actually would also have preferred to still continue to look the other way until the imposition of the national security law. So when, the, when London decided that, yeah, we're going to open our doors um, to all holders of the British national overseas passports and to, to, to a path of citizenship in the United Kingdom, Hong Kong people were actually shocked. Oh my God, they finally actually doing something um, after all of these years. And then Germany will continue to be mum, again, not until very recently that they are also criticizing Beijing. So China's economy, China used to be able to coerce all these different countries to, to, to its bidding. You know, you guys want to have access to a market, access to our money, then, you know, shut up, be quiet, but not anymore. So, and then when the international community is paying attention to Hong Kong, they're also paying attention to the situation in Xinjiang and uh, to the Uyghurs and, and Tibet, Tibetans that they used to, again, look the other way. So it is really bad. But at the same time, also going back to what I, at, at the end of the question, while protest is actually, it protests in Hong Kong are very difficult, but Hong Kongers overseas are very organized these days. And actually I've never seen Hong Kongers overseas this organized. So like on October 1st, for example, that there are protests everywhere um, with Hong Kong people and Uyghurs and Tibetans joining forces. Okay, maybe I can quickly take the uh, Greater Bay Area question and also the question addressed to me. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, it's a very good question, the Bigger Bay Area. I think one um, example that I immediately come to my mind is, for example, H HSBC, you know, the bank. It's caught, in, it's totally caught in the middle. 
between uh, wanting a bigger business in China and also um, being boycotted in Hong Kong by the pro-democracy supporters. Uh, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, there was this boycotting campaign um, against pro-government businesses. And, and HSBC won, also won a bigger business in, in China, especially in bigger Bay Area. So obviously we can see HSBC has been uh, on the one hand reprimanded by the U United States and uh, uh, they've be been named by uh, you know, uh, Secretary Pompeo. Uh, and at the same time, it's, you know, it's also under attack in China as well for not being very supportive of the national security law. So uh, what happened is that you know, the, uh, the director of the HSBC, very senior level, um, he had to sign the support for NSL, but in a very low profile way. <laughs> uh, trying not to, uh, um, trying not to, you know, do it too openly or to a high profile, so that to invite boycott in 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 the city. Uh, so, it, I, I, and I think this their situation uh, applies to a lot of other business which wants to do business in the Western market and also in China, um, and it will have a huge implication. And to to look at, you know, how how HSBC the, the case of it will develop. Uh, on the second question, uh, social security, uh, that, that has been a question that we have been uh, uh, um, you know, thinking about for, for a long time. I think social security, the worsening social security has always been quite worse in Hong Kong for a long time. Uh, for, 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 you know, because Hong Kong is a very capitalistic, very neoliberal city and the welfare is, is very bad here. So, um, and, and I, I think it's, it's kind of difficult to explain why, you know, suddenly uh, the, the uh, worsening social security will, will lead to the protest last year. So I think last year's protest was, uh, was political, was related to political reasons more than economic reasons. And economic reasons has always been seen as part and parcel of the political system. Okay, so, so that's why I, I don't think it's solely attributed to the fact that people you know, couldn't afford uh, an apartment. Thank you. Thank you, Samson. Um, I, I apologize for not mentioning the name of the questioner. The, the question which was answered by Victoria was asked by our young scholar, uh, Alpana Verma, and the uh, Samson answered the question regarding Big Bay and businesses that was asked by Professor uh, Partho Mukhopadhyay. So now we turn to uh, Anant Kumar Giri, who wishes to uh, speak up his question to Ilaria. Anant, please. Yeah, you have to unmute yourself. So thank you so much. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you are. So thank you all dear friends. So my query to uh, Ilaria Maria is that the whole poetics of protest uh, and, and poetics understood in a very broad way uh, in the sense that, that when we are pressed to the limit, the kind of creative forms it is taking also through poetry and a comparison with Delhi is that the Delhi protest was inspired by the, the, the poems of uh, Hassan Manto and, and it creates. But the poetry also the way it can be tied to new constitutional and, and legal imagination. I'm wondering, and here I ask these queries to friends like Sebastian's and others who are much more in the social science field. Now, what kind of new imaginations of autonomy is emerging when Hong Kong is pushed into this corner and, and not even the ways of finding freedom and possibilities, even when they are being, when citizens and, and, and are being pushed into such an authoritarian draconian corner. Thank you very much for this question. Um, I think that when we talk about all the spaces that are being closed down, we also have to keep in mind that there are a lot of people who are also trying to expand what is possible in different platforms. So for example, um, one thing 
one phenomenon that is very clear to anyone who follows the publishing industry is that there has been in Hong Kong a zine explosion. So you now have on every possible uh, subject, um, a lot of uh, printing of very often very graphically interesting new zines, which are either um, sort of graphic stories or uh, poetry or uh, short stories, photographic images, re-elaborated images, and uh, especially as far as um, cartoons, illustration are concerned, there is a lot, a lot that is coming out. And uh, while some of the traditional spaces, traditional bookshops that were, um, they were quite well known have had um, numerous issues, whether we talk about the Causeway Bay bookshop, which has been, as we know, the, the people have been arrested, they have been taken to China, and that has been one of the most aggressive operations that uh, have been carried out in terms of imposed censorship on the publishing industry. Um, together with this clamping down, there is also many new outlets which are actually selling books, they're selling zines, they're sell they are um, existing as informal spaces for people to meet and exchange ideas. There is one website which is called Hong Kong Protesting, hkprotesting.com, which is uh, run by the only online um, English language literary magazines called Asian Cha and uh, Hong Kong protesting has been uh, putting together a number of texts by um, Hong Kong writers. Some of them are translated from Chinese, others are written directly in English. And it's basically an ongoing anthology of uh, poems and uh, um, other literary works and also some photographic works that tries to collect and uh, and archive in a way the um, the creative works from uh, Hong Kong writers and uh, I can also say that some of the issues that are being discussed today are issues that have been taken to the fore by the protests in 2019 and have come out of more restricted circles, in particular things like archives. Um, Hong Kong does not have an archival law. Uh, some of the problems that we have seen with the enactment of the national security law has been that certain um, cer certain like RTHK, for example, have decided that even some of the things they already had on their websites might have become in breach of the national security law, so they were taken down. In particular, I'm referring to the interview of uh, Nathan Law, who is now an exile in uh, the UK. And there was a segment with interviews by Nathan Law that was taken down by RTHK, fearful that this was in breach of the national security law. And so there are now many more people who are talking both in a creative way, in a poetic way, about what it is to have memory, what it is to preserve the memory, but also what it is to keep real archives and whether Hong Kong can keep archives either online, either physical, here in Hong Kong, or whether they need to be taken outside of Hong Kong, given the national security law implementation. So um, if you're interested in following what is happening in English, I again refer you to hongkongprotesting.com, the website. Uh, for disclosure, there are also some of my poems there. And um, otherwise, if you can read Chinese, I would suggest that you, you try to get some of the multiple zines that are being published by all sorts of um, um, new creative groups in, uh, in Hong Kong. Okay, um, thank you so much. <laughs> we have some more questions, but I'm afraid uh, we have completely run out of time and we have consumed our extra bonus time for Q&A also. So uh, I just need half a minute to announce the end of today's event and my um, uh, deep uh, gratitude to all the four guest speakers. It was really very, very educative and stimulative uh, experience for me. And I hope uh, same for the, all the participants. I once again, thank you all the guest speakers 
and I also thank ICS and Anand and uh, Samanvaya uh, for organizing this. Thank you very much. Stay safe and take care. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.